Well, again, we are going to be moving into chapter three of this wonderful book of Jonah. And I, I call the message, The Message Heard Around Nineveh. The Message Heard Around Nineveh, because it's kind of like the message heard around the world. And I find it interesting as we come to this passage because, you know, at, when you look at our lives, when we fall into sin, when we trip or go into great trials, we usually are changed people, are we not? We usually face this awkwardness in our own lives, and therefore we look at ourselves and we become changed. That's what discipline does. That's, that's what discipleship is all about. So we go from step to step in our, in our sanctification. We also know that going through this book, the Lord chastises those whom he loves. And what we, we understand is no matter how far we have, may have strayed or no matter how deep we may have taken that dive off the platform, God is always going to restore us. He will always grab our attention. He will always lead us to circumstances in our lives. And when we are walking with him and we are sensitive to his ways, we will be changed forever. That's true. Now you would think Jonah would have picked up on this. You would, have, you would think that Jonah, after being swallowed up by this great fish, being spat up alive upon the shores, after going through all of that, that chapter 3 would have opened up with, and after washing the gooey slime off himself, Jonah fell to his face in prayer and repentance and called out to the living God. But that's not what happens, is it? Now, Jonah's character has definitely changed. We see the unfaithfulness of the prophet change, but for Jonah, there's silence. It doesn't kick into with anything about Jonah's heart or what Jonah went through. Now, don't get me wrong. The experience that Jonah goes through, it definitely does change him to the point where he's now going to obey. But the question for Jonah is, and I think when we do a self-reflection for all of us, is was Jonah being obedient out of forceful compliance? Or is he now finally going to go and preach the word because he has joy? Is Jonah going to Nineveh now because his heart was truly changed? Or is he simply going to self-preserve himself? Because he's already told God no once by his actions. He's already refused to do what God said, and he knows the consequences will be severe. But here we are in this book, and then chapter 3 for behold, forgive me one second. When we, go, when we go to chapter 3, we see that Jonah gets up and he moves. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So not the, just the first time, but the second time. And then God says, go to Nineveh or Nineveh. And then he goes and all of a sudden, now he finally rises up. And then when it gets to the second part of verse 3, we hear about the greatness of the city. And the reason I want to talk about the greatness of the city is because we often look at our Bible movies and we think of this ancient city, like maybe the size of a small little village. Maybe you travel to northern Ontario and you go through a, a little place like, you know, Espanola or out in Alberta, a little lodge pole. You got a couple houses here and maybe an old beat up restaurant next to a gas station. And we think in the ancient world that this city, this Assyrian city, was some kind of small little place. But no, it was huge. Jonah is called to go into the midst of this city and give proclamation of God's word. You can think about it like Mississauga. Have you ever thought about walking through Mississauga from one end to another? Well, Jonah was doing that. It says in scripture that it was a three days journey or this breadth. And so what we're learning that before the destruction of this city, it was massive. It was absolutely massive. And here he is in one day's walk and then he starts yelling the, the whole city is going to be overthrown in 40 days. 120 kilometers in our modern distance keeping. Here he is in a 120 kilometer distance city going on a one day's journey before that. Proclaiming the word of God. And that's what verse 4 says. And then Jonah began to go through the city on one day's walk, so you know he's already in deep into this great city. And he says, yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. 
overthrown. Not slightly rebuked. Not slightly challenged. But in the scriptures when it says that Jonah cried out against this city, he was giving them the warning. He was being very direct with his proclamation. It is going to come to utter destruction. It's ruin. Now the ancient world would have understood either through myth or through reality about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They would have heard about this ancient city that was utterly destroyed through brimstone and fire. They would know that when the wrath of God is set against a certain place, there is nothing that place can do to ever appease such wrath. And yet here they are, and they're hearing this message of destruction and giving the opportunity for repentance. There was another prophet who spoke about great destruction. There was one who spoke and proclaimed a very similar message to that that Jonah had to preach. And this man was called to preach it to the most religious, the most arrogant, the ones who thought they had it all together. This prophet had to speak regarding the coming of the Lamb of God who is worthy to take away the sins of the world. This prophet was named John the Baptizer. His last name was not Baptist. He was John the Baptizer. In Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah, Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now for that crowd, they ignored for the most part what was being said. And we can pretty much tell that even in Jonah's time, that they may have thought 40 days was a little bit odd. But they're going to be destroyed. See, the message is the same today as it was in the ancient world. For them, they knew in 40 days they were going to be destroyed. But for people upon this earth, they seem to forget even the here and now that there is a day of destruction coming. We don't preach repent of the gospel for 40 days that you are going to die. We preach repent for you will die. 10 out of 10 people die. You get older, your hair turns gray, your smooth skin becomes wrinkly, and then one day your eyes will close and that will be the end on this earth until the great resurrection. If you look at John chapter 3 verses 18 through 19, we understand that John was preaching the exact same message that Jonah was preaching, and even Jesus is preaching the same, that God will indeed destroy all individuals who are found guilty and who are found to be in sin in his presence. We love John 3.16, right? We love that verse, for God so loved the world. It's beautiful. He gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish. We'll have everlasting life. We love that verse. But we don't like verses 18 and 19. It says, he who believes in him is not to be judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. In fact, if you go to the final verse of John chapter 3, it is verse 36 and says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So John the baptizer was proclaiming a message that Christ has, is able to take away their sins. And likewise, Jonah is walking around this great ancient city, this Assyrian city, saying that in 40 days that God is going to bring destruction against this place. And it was so powerful, his preaching, it was so matter of fact that the people automatically knew they had to come to repentance. Now we know faith come by hearing, hearing the word of Christ. We know that the general call goes out. We call this the effectual call of the gospel. And we know the Holy Spirit is at work. And so we know then that no person, no human, in, in any aspect of all of history of mankind could ever come to salvation unless God first awakens them. And here we are, going into verse 5, and we get confirmation of this. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. And they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. 
Remember, Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah wanted to jump on that boat headed to Tarshish out of that port in Joppa. And here he is preaching destruction or repentance or what we would call modern day hellfire brimstone preaching. But these people believed. And it's very significant, my dear friends, that they believed what Jonah was preaching. And it's all woven together here. And if you look at the, the way the Hebrew language is written, and you look at the very specifics of how it is written, then the people believed in God. Where else do we find that? The term, believed in God. Well, it's a pagan city. It's filled with people who had no knowledge of who God was. But God called one man who was also a Gentile at one point in history. And he said to that one man, you will be the father to many nations. He is known as the father Abraham. And in Genesis 15, 6, it says, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned to him as righteousness. You see, God in his own choosing and his own doing called Abram. And when he called him, he told him how it's all going to play out. And Abram believed in God. Abram and God had a covenant together. God changed his name to Abraham. In fact, in Romans 4, 3, Paul says, for what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him as righteousness. And I share that is because these people in this land of destruction, they heard the news of peril. They heard the news that they were disobeying God. They heard the news that God was not pleased with their living, and they believed in Yahweh. They truly believed that Yahweh could restore them and deliver them and that the God of the Israelites, the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the only way out of this calamity. And because of that, God honors his word. They were exhibiting sound faith. What Jonah was preaching humbled them, brought them low, brought them to a place of repentance. And they just didn't repent with words. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing, my dear friends. In the ancient world, when you would repent, you would just rip your garments as an expression of what is going on inside. They would take ashes and sit on them and sometimes push them up upon their head to show that they were mourning, they were broken. We get an example of this in Joel 1, 13 and 14. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. So these people heard Jonah preach and it brought them to the place of sackcloth. It brought them to a place to call out to the living God. To a place to trust God, to believe in God. Isn't that so wonderful about Jonah's preaching? It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter where their hearts were. These were people from all over the world listening to this message. They, that ancient Assyrian city would have been much like Mississauga, Toronto, what, whatever. Do you know what happened in this city? May I say revival? In a sense, there was a revival. All people, without distinction, were coming to salvation. The old, the young, all of them. And then all of a sudden you come to verse 6. And the news spreads to the king. And when the king hears this, he equally joins in this lamenting, in this sackcloth. That he takes, he rises from his throne. He casts down his garments. 
That's incredible. Listen to the lang- listen to the language what your Bible's telling you. He actually leaves his throne. Why does he leave his throne? Because he knows at that moment there is somebody far more deserving, somebody more higher, somebody who's more supreme and more sovereign and properly fitting. He walks away from that throne because at that moment, only God matters. He removes his robe. The very robe that is arrayed with all the symbols of his royalty. This robe that shows his authority. This robe that shows who he is, that he can boast in. And it's removed to show that he is now expressing humility. He's now on the same level. The greatest king is now on the same level with the most lowly peasant. In the presence of God. And like everyone else, he covers himself with sackcloth and ashes. He goes into deep mourning. He's doing this because he is humbled. But yet, in the church today, in the world today, we preach a message that does not cause men to humble and bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If only we as men and women could see the significance of this event taking place. So many of us and so many claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, yet they sit upon their own thrones. And they claim that they become a Christian through a simple prayer, but they've never risen from their thrones. They've never casted off their righteousness and all their works of evil and contempt. They rely upon their own status. They rely upon their own autonomous authority. They claim to be people of the cross, yet they've never truly died to self. And we see in this king that he died that day. May we learn from this king. May we as Christians who have heard the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ come to this place of knowledge that there is no title, there is no position. We are all humbled under the cross. Equal. And then we come into verse 8. And he makes this decree. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let man call on God earnestly. That each man may turn from his wicked way, from the violence which he ha- is in his hands. So the king gives a proclamation for all the people. Have we, pr- have we prayed for Canada thinking that there's no way that Canada could ever face such a thing? It's important. It is so important that what takes place in this city that Jesus himself talks about it in Matthew 12, 41. It says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. That should be someone. It's at this point in the message I want to talk about the ineffectiveness of modern day preaching. Because Jesus teaches us here that he came and he told us what we are to say. He's given us the word of what we're supposed to preach. And there is a great ineffectiveness of the preaching today in our pulpits. We see that Jonah went into this city filled with men and women, all without distinction. It didn't matter about their skin color. It didn't matter about what tongue or language they had. But when he went in and preached, young and old came to repentance. Even the king and the king's courts came to repentance. And do you know why that happened, my dear friends? Was it because Jonah was a great orator? No. Because of the unction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was moving. The Holy Spirit was at work. And when the work of God is taking place, and when the Holy Spirit is moving, people get converted. Leonard Ravenhill says it best, if Jesus preached the same message preachers today preach, he never would have been crucified. I don't necessarily agree with that, but his point that he's making is right. He also said if you want to be popular... Preach happiness. If you want to be unpopular, preach holiness. Jonah was preaching the holiness of God. 
What an indictment. What an indictment. Because preaching with boldness and preaching with power can only come from the unction of the Spirit himself. And I'm learning, even in my ministry, we don't need to be loud. We don't need to be screaming. We don't need to be controversial. We just need to be biblical. In Acts 2, Peter delivers a sermon just after Pentecost happened. So after this sermon, he was preaching to those who were listening. And guess what happened? Peter didn't have to beg. Just like this Assyrian city. They didn't yell out to Jonah, what must we do to be saved? They just simply did it. But here, they did say, what shall we do? The truth hit him to the heart. Peter's preaching so, so powerfully. What, what is it that we're required to do? And Peter says, repent. And they repented. And the gospel had great power. But we don't see that in our churches these days, do we? We see models, we see programs, we see all these things so that we can grow in numbers and grow in strength. But yet all throughout the scriptures, we see that when God moves, something, excuse me, when God speaks, something happens. When God speaks, there is movements. And we don't need the chairs to be the plumb line of our ministry. We don't need to have how many people are sitting in, under the word or how many followers we have on social media. No, 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 no. God's word and the movement of the spirit within a church is the plumb line for any ministry. And if the ministry and the preaching of the word is right, men and women get changed. We look at the beginning of the age, what happens? God said, let there be, and it was. When God spoke, creation came into existence. There was the expanse in the midst of the waters, and he simply spoke, and there was light. There was night. There was vegetation. There was animals, all by the command of his word. So we need to remember that when God's word is faithfully proclaimed and preached, something always happens. When God speaks, the lame walk. When God speaks, the blind see, the deaf hear. When God speaks, the dead are raised. When John the Baptist preached, many were going out to see him from all over the region to be baptized. So many people were going out, it got the attention of the Pharisees. When Jesus preached, the masses came. Thousands upon thousands of people came to hear what was going on to the point that Jesus performed the miracle with the fishes and the loaves. And we have to ask in our day and age, why is it that when God's word is being preached in the scripture, great things happen, great revival happens. But when God's word is being preached in this day, in this hour, we don't see anything happening. Again, when Peter preached, the people were pierced to the hearts. 3,000 individuals came to the faith. When Philip was preaching, many were coming forward. They were hearing the gospel. They were seeing the miracles. Why? Because when God speaks, there's movement. There is movement. Paul gets it. He understood. There was riots when Paul preached. Because he was preaching God's word. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to today to say, if you walk into a church service and it's super comfortable, and you walk out going, well, wasn't that quaint? The preacher didn't do his job. When the Holy Spirit moves, only two things are going to happen. Either they're going to riot or they're going to repent. Then the third, there's going to be revival. Paul knew this. And so we look at all of these accounts, and you look at all of this stuff, and you bring it back to this Assyrian city. Jonah preached, and there was repentance. The rebellious, hard heart became soft. The evil and wicked hands changed. And I have to wonder what's going on around the globe today. What's going on in our communities, in our churches what is going on with all of these so-called preachers and teachers that are taking place? 
And when I look around and I, and I, I examine the scriptures and I see this man, Jonah, who was rebellious towards the call of God, he had to be rebuked, he had to go through trials. When I see this, though, and I see this man preach, and I look around, and I see all the masses of churches from every denomination, from Roman Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, Baptist, I don't care what it is. And I look around to see what's going on. I'm often struggling because these are men and women of God. They claim to love God, to love his word. They claim to be redeemed. They, to me, are like Israel. But yet there's so much rebellion. There is so much compromise. There is so much that the spirit of God is not even moving anymore. And I often have to ask the question, that God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? Can these bones live? Because Ezekiel had that vision regarding the house of Israel. When all hope seemed to have perished, Israel's cut off. And here he comes to the valley of dry bones. And it's so much like the Christian church today. We have so many pragmatic preachers, but there's no Holy Spirit. We have so many churches, but they're nothing but bones. In Ezekiel 37, 1 to 10, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them around about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. So just in case you all know, at the end of verse 2, they were really dead for a long time. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was noise, and behold, the rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So only the power of God could do this. Only the breath of God can do this. And we must remember the same word for breath, wind, and spirit in the Greek is pneuma. The Holy Spirit. Then all of a sudden down in verse 14 we read this amazing account. God says, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. And one thing we know about God restoring Israel and God giving Ezekiel this promise about restoration and about the dry bones becoming life, he never, ever, ever leaves his church to be overtaken. He never allows his people to be overtaken. He is always about the business of redemption and redeeming. And he's always going to be redeeming those who are scattered, just like he did in Nineveh. You can look at that city, overtaken in sin, overtaken in lust, overtaken with the works of their evil hand, and yet God still purposed that there were men and women, young and old, from all statures of life that were going to come to salvation. Why? They were God's people. They were God's people. And God rescues his people through the effectual call. Through Jonah's preaching, the Holy Spirit, doing the work of regeneration, made them alive. And dear friends, that teaches us that we need to be people like this in our church. We need to be preaching with powerful sermons that are anointed by the Holy Spirit, not by the flesh. 
We need to be praying that our leaders and our magistrates would all come to this place because if the king of Assyria can come to the knowledge of the Holy One, Justin Trudeau can come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and repent from his sins. And our governments can call and say, we got it wrong. There is only one God, one king, one ruler, and we're not it. And we can see revival happen in our land as well. But we need the church to be full of the Spirit, to give the unction call of repentance and to be mourning in sackcloth and ashes. There needs to be a call from the wicked ways. There needs to be a proclamation to turn towards God. Why? Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Who here loves to go fishing? I knew. We got to go fishing, buddy. For you who don't like to go fishing, when you get yourself a really nice fish, especially a rainbow trout, you take that fillet knife after you scale it and you run it straight down the center, right down the spine, and it flops both sides of that dead fish open. And you can see everything. That's what this verse is about. There's not even a single part of your being that God is not aware of and that the word of God doesn't impact. And I share that is because Jonah goes in and he preaches the word. We have the word. And so when we're not adulterating the gospel, we're not polluting the gospel. And when we're praying and surrender to the Spirit's work and preach the truth, the whole truth, and only the truth, we should expect the same results when we are doing God's work that Jonah experienced. When we're hit with the glory and the work of Christ, his passion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. We are hit with life. But what needs to happen first? God needs to speak. Not Pastor Steve, not John MacArthur, not a street evangelist. God, and he has spoken in his word. And until the church awakens to this reality and starts preaching his word, speaking his word, praying his word, breathing his word, we will not experience these things. Remember when God speaks, there's movement. Dry bones come to life. When God speaks, men and women are converted. And though Canada will not see a great revival in the sense of Chronicles, which I'm about to state, this was for the nation of Israel, we are the church. And we can look at 2 Chronicles 7.14 and keep it to our context. And my people who are called by my name, we can say Christians, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn their, way from their, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. In other words, they will, he will heal the churches. Like the Ninevites, There is a need for the Christian to turn their face back towards God, my friends. We're Christian. They weren't. We need to turn our face back towards God. We need to repent of our wicked ways. Because it's then and only then that God will hear our prayer. Think about that. Is there animosity in your heart towards a brother or sister? Is there animosity towards a friend or a family member? Is there hidden sin? Is your computer browser the indictment of what you do when you spend your time? Or the empty, or the empty beer bottles piling up on the back porch that you're not near the Lord enough? It is time that the Christian church needs to wake up and look at these stories such as Nineveh and realize that we are on the cusp of an amazing thing. We are living in a day and age where we can say we are indeed walking and living in Nineveh or Nineveh. However, we can see an explosion of God's work through repentance of these people. The church does not need to decline. The church needs a revival. 
When we start remembering this, we say that there needs to be a revival here in the pulpits. There needs to be a revival in the pews. There needs to be a revival in the homes. Remember, Jonah walked in this place and he was preaching. And when he was preaching, the power of God was moving. We've learned in verse 5 that the message even changed the king in verses 6 and 7 about the king's decree to all the people. Verse 8, that the king wanted God's anger to be turned. Then we come to verse 9. I'm almost done. Remember, Nineveh is not Israel. They were not Judah. They were Assyrians. But listen to what verses 9 and 10 says. The king says, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Did you know right now there are people in this community wondering if God can forgive them? They are wondering if God still loves them. They are wondering if God actually exists. There are people who don't even know, but they know something is going on, and they can't figure out how God's going to work. But may I share with you today, one of the biggest issues we have going on right now in the Christian church, regardless of the title above its door, is the church has become so lethargic and so apathetic to the individuals who truly want to know who God is, and that they will actually get off the pews, get out of their homes, and actually do what we're called to do, we would see men and women crying out to to be saved like it happened in Nineveh. The language is clear. When you look at verses 9 and 10, it says the king was hoping and he wanted to reconcile himself and his people to Yahweh. He didn't want the destruction to come. But there's a term here that we need to understand when I close this off. That God may relent. If you look at it very carefully, it says, Meodea a Yashuv vaniyam ha Elohim veshav meheron apo velo neved. And it's the reason why I say it that way, because in the Hebrew, you need to understand what is being said. And that is that God would turn the heat of his nose away from them. And when you hear that language of the heat of the nose away from them, It is his wrath, his burning anger. He is hoping that God will not do what the prophet had decreed will come to pass. And when you read that term in English, who knows, we also look at it with like, huh, who knows? Kind of like rhetorical. Who left the cookies out? Uh, Who knows? But in Hebrew, it's an expression of hope. Who knows? God may relent. It's not him hoping. He's ho- like, sorry, he's hoping that God would relent. It's not a rhetorical question. The king has hope over the character of God. And the second important part is this term relenting. Yes, it means sorry. It means to pull back. It's a gracious act. But we must remember that God cannot change who he is. He is the unchangeable one. In, in immutability, immutability, immutability is the attribute that God cannot change. We must remember the term semper idem. He is always the same in his character, in his thought. So the king here is not asking that God would change his character. But when we read scripture, we must remember that God always gives us a way out. When he preaches destruction and disaster, there's always grace and mercy. When he says that unless you do this, God knows the hearts and the tensions of all men. And so he knows who's going to repent and he knows who is not. But here's the sad thing. It's how the church is much like Jonah. Why did that word novade? perish. If you go back and read Jonah 1 to where we are today, you're going to notice something. 
you'll notice the men on the boat cried out that they would not perish. You're going to note that the captain comes to Jonah in that boat so they would not perish. You're going to note that in our reading this morning that even the king is hoping and has hope that the anger of God, the heat of his nose would be turned away from them so that they would not perish. But there's one man who has no concern or care or has even brought up the aspect of them perishing. And that's Jonah. Read it. It's not there. Jonah did not care about them perishing. He had no concern about them perishing. His heart hasn't been turned yet. Thankfully, God saw the hearts. How many of us are like Jonah? Because next week, we're going to open up the scriptures, and we're going to learn that Jonah was still hard in heart. And he's been told to go to a place with the multitudes of men and women who are going to be destroyed by the hand of God's wrath, and he didn't even care. And the church of Jesus Christ today, we're more concerned with our programs and our websites, and we're more concerned about killing each other with arrows and destroying one another's reputation. We're more concerned about our bank accounts and our retirement funds. We're more concerned about what churches we're going to attend and what we're not going to do. We're more concerned about our reputation. Meanwhile, our neighbors, our friends, our family are crying out for hope. They want to hear about the gospel. They want want to know that there's life some way, somehow, and we are so preoccupied in our own self-righteousness, we're nothing more than Jonah. We don't care. As I said a couple weeks ago, we might as well replace those Jesus fishes on our car with go to hell. Did I hit you? Yes, God is sovereign. And through his effectual call of the gospel, he saves his elect. But do not forget that he has ordained the church to be his mouthpiece. And this is why I believe so many churches are dying. Because they preach a gospel about their own well-being their own happiness, their own position. They're utilitarian at the best. They're no longer moved. They're no longer moved. God loved those people in Assyria enough to send them a prophet to preach destruction because he knew what was going to come. Just like God raised a church and commissioned them to go and to preach the gospel baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded. And lo, he is with us till the end of the age. He cares enough about the men and women in Mississauga, but yet we don't even share it. Those people came to a place of repentance. That is what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It humbles us. And for those who are dead, they are made alive. And for those who are dry, are revived. It is our job, church, to tell the world about the merciful love of our God. It is our job to tell them that they are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. The Bible doesn't ask if you're comfortable with it. It doesn't ask if you agree with it. But for many of us, it's about time we get off the ship heading to Tarshish get back to the business of preaching to Nineveh.